Welcome, Ocean students, to our accelerated course, which starts today. The course is Engl 256, Word Literature, 1600 to the present. I'm your on-site tutor, Professor Shireen Mazloum, and I believe that you all know me. And we will be discussing together basic points of the course throughout these short presentations. We will also have online communication on Sundays and Thursdays as organized by your team. You have three different online tutors, Margot Bremer, and she is the tutor for uh, third year students, cohort two. We also have Lisa Grande and Sam Zahran, and these are the tutors for the second year students or cohort three. Of course, you will find their contacts on Canvas and you need to follow up as usual with your online tutors because they are the ones who determine the deadlines and correct the assignments. The course material is a textbook. It's the Northern Anthology of World Literature and it's three volumes, D, E and F. And as long as the book is not available, you will have scanned copies sent to you by the Ocean Unit. I've added a very important disclaimer, and you will find this disclaimer in each presentation, that this presentation is not enough. It is not a substitute for the course material. It's simply a guide that I have prepared as a substitute for our face-to-face -face classes. The assessments that you will be doing in this course include the following. You have discussions, 12%, quizzes, 13%, a midterm exam, 17%, critical response essays, and we have two of them, and a research paper, 20%, and then a final exam on the final week of the course, and it's 17%. This is a very, very brief guide for you so that you don't get lost amid all the confusion about the main assessments. We have five main assessments and we have ongoing quizzes and discussions. The first critical response essay, one, is going to be due in April, on April 13th, and this is module five. The midterm exam, 50 questions, multiple choice, are, is due on April 20th, and this is module eight. The second critical response essay is due on May 4th, and this is module 11. The final research paper and the final exam are due on May 12th, and this is module 15. You have quizzes, okay, and in each quiz you will have 10 multiple choice questions. And you have discussions, except for module 8 and module 15 where you have the exams. You don't also have quizzes on module eight and module 15 because you already have the exams. We will be discussing all these assessments in detail later on. This is just for you as a guide so that you get, don't get lost amid all the confusion. Module one and two, which we will be discussing this time, are due 30th March. The main readings of the modules are the Enlightenment period, and this has to do with the Norton Anthology, Volume D. You need to read Immanuel Kant's The Enlightenment, uh, What is the Enlightenment? This is an essay, and you will find the essay online if you don't get the scanned copies soon. You are also going to read Moliere's Tartuffe, and this is a play written by the French dramatist Moliere, and you may find the PDF as well online. Otherwise, you will need to refer to the book. Today, we're going to discuss the first discussion of module one, and the discussion is entitled Dare to Know. I will read the discussion first, and then I'm going to explain some tips that are going to help you understand and perform well in doing the discussion. The discussion asks you to examine Kant's exhortation 
sapri od. This is a Latin word which means there to know, or a Latin statement which means there to know. And it asks you, what does there to know mean to you? Do you think that our own times are like the Enlightenment period? Okay, to give you a brief idea about what is the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment is the time of the 17th century when thinkers, who are called Enlightenment thinkers, started discussing the need for human beings to be rational beings, to use their reason, and not to rely on others to make decisions from themselves. And according to these thinkers, Enlightenment means freedom of thinking, freedom of speech, and freedom to take decisions. Immanuel Kant, one of the most important German Enlightenment thinkers, wrote an essay which he entitled What is the Enlightenment? This essay was published in a German journal or a German magazine, and he defined the Enlightenment by his statement of dare to know. What does this dare to know statement mean? It means that human beings or man must have the courage to use his mind without the help of someone else. So Kant is asking us to use our minds to rely on our own thinking in order to understand the world without the need of anyone's help. We don't need guardians to tell us what to think and what to do and how to act. And I gave you here an exact quote from the translation of the work, because the work is originally written in German, have the courage to use your own understanding. This is the motto of the Enlightenment, and this is the meaning of the dare to know. According to Kant, people don't think for themselves because they are lazy and cowards. And if you want to think for yourself, you need to have courage. Of course, the discussion here is an opinion discussion. That's why you should not be all writing the same thing. But we are here brainstorming ideas together to make it easier for you to decide what is the meaning of dare to know. And we already said that the meaning of dare to know is to have the courage, to have the ability to think for yourself and do not rely on others to think for you or to help you understand or to tell you what to do and to make decisions for you. Do you think this is relevant to our own times? I think yes, of course. Now, especially with all the COVID-19 or the coronavirus uh, rumors and uh, info and the a lot of things that are going on in the world, which is telling us wrong information, if we are not going to use our own minds to really filter the information that we are getting, we are going to be helpless. Unless we go, okay, search for ourselves, rely on reliable sources like the WHO or the Center for Infection Control, for example, we will be bombarded with fake news and we are going to be duped or fooled by the fake news because we don't have enough reliable information. This is one example. Another example is actually your own online teaching. Your own online teaching, your own courses at Ocean, is all about you becoming independent, autonomous learners, able to search for information, think for yourselves, make decisions for yourself. And all the questions and all the discussions help you to develop critical thinking skills. So yes, the Enlightenment motto is still relevant to our modern times. I also summarized for you here some of the main important points that are found in the module one. The very first thing is that Kant pub published the essay in December 1784. It was first published in the issue of the Berlin Monthly, and this is the title of a magazine or a journal just like Al-Ahram in Egypt. A key idea of the Enlightenment is that a person should make up his or her own mind. This is one of the key ideas. So he asks us to dare to know. This is the translation of the Latin motto for the Enlightenment. 
also satire and by satire we mean the type of writing that ridicules limited concepts hypocrisy duplicity cowardice ignorance and this is a kind of writing and a form of art which became very popular in the enlightenment period satire bil arabi illa huwa al kitaba al sakhira wal kitaba al sakhira بتدعو الى اعمال العقل لان احنا طول الوقت لما بنلاقي حاجه فيها سخريه okay, وفيها ايروني اللي هو نوع مقنن من السخريه بنفكر ولما بنفكر وي ار ايبل تو ثينك اند تو كام اب وذ اور اون كونكلوجنز اند انفرنسز اذر مين بوينتس ذات يو نيد تو نو اباوت موديل 1 هاز تو دو وذ بلايند فيث The Enlightenment are against the idea of blind faith. Well, blind faith هو الإيمان الأعمى. والإيمان الأعمى اللي هو الإيمان اللي بيخلي أي حد مؤمن uh, follower يعني تابع لا يفكر لا ينقض ولا يستخدم عقله. وطبعا كل الأديان بتدعو إلى إعمال العقل. So the Enlightenment goal is that we need to think even if we are going to think about faith and religion we have to think okay otherwise we will be followers and we might be abused or disadvantaged by the guardians who are taking control of the society the other idea is that god's presence is found by looking at nature rather than traditional religious texts and this is called deism so deism is a movement that believes that we can find god if we look at nature and if we count the blessings that we have in our lives that a person even if he is illiterate even if he doesn't know how to read and write he doesn't need to read texts in order to know that there is god Another main point is that Kant believes that a good ruler is not worthy to lead if he doesn't provide religious freedom to his people. So if a person wants to be a good king or a prince, he must provide religious freedom for his people because freedom to choose okay, how to practice religion and which religion to follow is one of the most important things that Kant asks for. So the Enlightenment in general requires freedom. and it also requires rational thinking or the use of reason or the use of our minds okay so now we have finished with the brief of module 1 we are going to go on to module 2 and module 2 is about a play masrahiya it's called tartuffe and it is written by moliere and moliere is a very famous french dramatist كاتب مسرحي فرنسي مشهور من طبعا من مشهورين جدا 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 موليير تارتوف اسم المسرحية واسم واحد الشخصيات في المسرحية هنلاقي المسرحية موجودة في النورتن انثولوجي وهنلاقي منها بي دي اف اونلاين فور فري شخصيات المسرحية characters in the play We have Oregon, master of the house, and he is a very wealthy man. He is a very powerful man. He is married to someone called Elmir, and Elmir is his second wife. And he finds that he has no value on, on his life, and he decides to ask Tartuffe, and Tartuffe is a religious person, to come to his house in order to inspire him about the value of life. So he is a person who has everything, power, money, a good family, and he still feels that life is meaningless. He is shown to us as a very naive person, as a very devoted religious person, and that's why he is fooled by Tartuffe. Tartuffe is the religious hypocrite. So he pretends to be a religious man, but in reality he is a hypocrite, he is a fraud, يعني محتال ومنافق. When he goes to Oregon's house, all what he is trying to do all the time is to take advantage of Oregon's naivety. Sazaget Oregon. عايز يستغل سازاجت Oregon. So he tries to seduce his wife, Oregon's wife, Elmir. He, try, he wants to marry the daughter because he's going to get all the money if he marries the daughter. 
And Oregon refuses to see that Tartuffe is really a fraud and an imposter, even though everyone around him is telling him that he is not a religious person, that he is a hypocrite, and that he is a liar, but still he refuses to see that, and he is fooled by him. We also have Damis, and Damis is Oregon's son from his first wife, and he is the one who hates Tartuffe, and he wants to actually get rid of him, and he's all the time warning his father, Oregon, that Tartuffe is a liar. We have Kleinty, Elimir's brother, who is the voice of reason. We have Valer, Marianne Souter. Marianne is the daughter of Oregon, and she has the Souter, yani her fiancé, and she, he is the love of her life. And Oregon decides that he's going to marry Marianne to Tartuffe just as a reward for him because he likes him very much. He is willing, Oregon, to destroy his daughter, okay, and to destroy the love of her life just because he is a naive person. Of course, we have Tartuffe, and we said that Tartuffe is a hypocrite. He pretends to be a religious man, although he is not. He is a liar, he is a thief, he is a hypocrite, and he is a seducer. We have minor characters, and these minor characters are an M. Loyal. He's the officer who serves eviction papers to Oregon. I'm going to tell you the story of the play now, and you will know that towards the end of the play, Tartuffe tries to frame Oregon by faking charges against him, and he wants the king to take the decision to expel Oregon and his family from the house, and Tartuffe is waiting for the house to be given to him as a reward. We also have Madame Parnell, Oregon's mother, who is again totally deluded and beguiled by Tartuffe. We have Elmir, Oregon's second wife, whom Tartuffe tries to seduce. We have Doreen, and Doreen is the maid, and she is a very in witty person, and witty means clever, and she gives a lot of satirical comments about Tartuffe, trying to expose that he was a, a liar and a hypocrite. And we also have a silent character, yani a character who does not speak, and her name is Fliput. Why am I mentioning all of these characters? Not to confuse you, but because you might have questions in the exams that refer to these characters. So you need to know the story, and you need to know each of the characters and their roles, and what is the most important feature that distinguishes them. This is a summary which I adapted to you from an online source, and it speaks about Oregon. As we said, Oregon is the very rich person. He asks Tartuffe, the hypocrite who pretends to be a religious man, to his house. And Tartuffe appears on stage in Act 3, but before that we keep hearing about him and we keep hearing about how he is deceiving Oregon. Oregon goes to the extent of marrying his own daughter, Marianne, to Tartuffe, although Tartuffe is a nobody, and Marianne is already engaged, but because he is so naive, and because Tartuffe is able to sway him and manipulate his emotions, he is willing to give up his daughter. We know that the rest of the family, besides his mother, sees Tartuffe for who he is. They see him as a liar and as a hypocrite. And it takes Tartuffe the whole two acts, until Act 3, which is the final act, in order to realize, sorry, it takes Oregon, the whole two acts, to realize that Tartuffe is a hypocrite and a liar, only when he sees him trying to seduce his wife. This is an important scene in the play. We have Oregon hiding under the table, and then Tartuffe is trying to seduce Elmir, and Oregon sees Tartuffe, and this is when he realizes that he's being fooled by a rogue, and the rogue means a very low person who has no morals and no ethics. He throws Tartuffe out of the house, and Tartuffe, as we said, tries to take revenge by compiling a list of charges against Oregon. He goes to the police with the list of charges, and really, this conspiracy is about to work. Oregon is going to lose his house, lose his family, lose his money, until the very end when the king shows up and 
The king, because he is presented to us in the play as a better judge of character than Oregon, sees Tartuffe for the hypocrite he is and has him arrested. Oregon's property is restored and everything ends happily because this is a comedy. Okay, so now I gave you a brief about the characters, a brief about the plot of the play or the summary of the play. Now we are going to deal with the discussion. And the discussion is entitled Hypocrisy. And the topic of the discussion is, and I'm going to read it, the concept of hypocrisy is often coupled with the idea of devotion in religion. In the play, the character of Tartu is somewhat comical, but the real focus is on Oregon because Oregon's faith leads to problems for his family. The question is, why does Oregon fall so easily to Tartuffe's act? Very simply, Oregon falls to Tartuffe because he is a limited person who does not think for himself. He is a blindly devoted religious Catholic. The second question is, why is it humorous? At points, it's humorous because it's a comedy, and it's humorous because it uses satire, it uses exaggerations, and it is a farce. Right. What I just said, though, these are the key points. Now I'm going to give you some tips for the discussion in detail. First of all, Tartuffe is a play Masrahiya, by Molière, Ketib Masrahi Frenzy, published May 12, 1664. The play is a three-act comedy, okay. and it was banned, banned yani it manait min al -ard, for attacking religion because it has a hypocritical and a satirical representation of Tartuffe. Tartuffe is supposed to be a religious man and he is presented in a very negative way in the play. That's why it was banned. The title of the play means hypocrite or imposter. And we have the main idea in the play is that wrong religious devotion, not using one's mind like Oregon, could end up in disaster. And the disaster, of course, that he loses his house, his family, and everything he has worked for all his life. The guide to the discussion. Again, you are not supposed to copy and you are supposed to use this only to give you ideas to write on your own and to continue further research on your own after you study the module. Taban Oregon is the main character in the play, although the title refers to Tartuffe. Tartuffe is not the important character in the play, he is of secondary importance. Oregon is the most important because it's the impact of Tartuffe on Oregon, which is the most important thing in the play. That he is an educated man who blindly follows Tartuffe, who thinks that Tartuffe is good and noble just because he is a religious man. He is unable to see that Tartuffe is a fraud, refuses to listen to his son's advice and warnings. So he is too cowardly and too lazy to think for himself. He is limited by blind faith. And I'm here reminding you of Kant and the whole concept of the Enlightenment. He is naive and so he falls for Tartuffe's acts and the result is that he's going to lose his house, marry his daughter off to a scoundrel, to a very low person, just because of his naivety. The play is a comedy. It uses satire to make the audience accept the theme of hypocrisy and deception of the religiously devoted organ. So satire here, أو السخرية, هي اللي بتخلينا نفهم ال naivety بتاعت Oregon. Oregon, as we said, is a man who has everything, money, power, a beautiful home, and a family. And he just invites Tartuffe, and this Tartuffe manipulates him, works on his emotions. And as we said, this is against the Enlightenment, because the Enlightenment wants us to think using our minds and our rational beings in order to have freedom of choice, freedom to make decisions, and freedom to make up our minds. So when Oregon asks Tartuffe in the home, his home is going to be chattered to pieces. He allows deception and seduction in, and this threatens everything, threatens him to lose everything. So reason is considered to be one of the highest virtues and Oregon is fooled because he does not use his reason. 
he only uses his emotions. So Oregon is the example of the irrational person. On the other hand, he is contrasted to Cleant, Doreen, Elmir, and his son, who use reason and who wants to expose Tartuffe that he is a deceiver. And of course, when we have the contrast between Tartuffe and between Oregon okay, and the rest of the characters, we can clearly see the difference between those who use reason and those who are easily swayed because of emotions. Why is the play considered humorous? And why do we have these humorous points? Because well, it's a farce. Farce يعني إيه؟ يعني a comedy which uses exaggerations. زي أفلام إسماعيل ياسين كده. These are considered to be farce. We have exaggerated, ridiculous behavior. And we are using exaggerated, ridiculous behavior because it's a way of mocking hypocrisy. Mocking يعني ترياء. It's also humorous because of the misunderstandings. All the first two acts, Oregon refuses to see that Tartuffe is a fraud. And we have all the time as audience references to what the other characters are saying about Tartuffe. And we know that Oregon is blind. Until the scene when Oregon decides to understand or actually sees Tartuffe for who he is, seducing his wife. And this scene is a very, very comic scene. Because Oregon is hiding under the table and Tartuffe is trying to seduce his wife. So it is done in a very comic way. So this means that Oregon is deceived because he is an emotional person. He does not think, he does not use his mind, and he is against, he's not the enlightened type of character that Kant was speaking of. It's also humorous because it's a comedy, it uses farce, exaggeration, and it is built on misunderstandings and satire. If you have further questions, we will be meeting twice online. One Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. for second year and Sunday from 2 to 3 p.m. also for second year. For third year, Thursday 3 to 4 p.m and Sunday 3 to 4 p.m. These online communication channels are going to be devoted for you if you have any questions concerning the modules. Thank you very much and stay safe.